Now we take a look at what happened in Northern Europe as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Here's a very typical but very, very well done piece by Hans Holbein the Younger. Now Holbein developed his career just at about the point where the Protestant Reformation took hold. You'll notice this is dated 1528. The Protestant Reformation began in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed 95 theses, propositions to the church door, which was the bulletin board of the day. That event triggered a massive movement that resulted in large areas of the northern part of Europe essentially separating themselves from the Catholic Church. This was a momentous development for art because what happened was art as you see here, which represented a holy figure, the Virgin Mary and Jesus, with these donors, Burgermeister and his family, became something that church people didn't want anymore. They didn't want art like this in their churches because they felt that it was idolatrous, that it led to the worship of holy figures and even holy images instead of Christianity based on the Bible and essentially an individual relationship with Jesus Christ and with God. If you were an artist interested in painting paintings like this, you uh, lost an awful lot of business. And about the only thing that really interested people anymore was this part of the drawing, which was a portrait of an individual person. Now notice Holbein, what he's done here. In this painting, down here at the bottom, is a lot of very, very fine representation of a carpet with a very interesting pattern to it and a very fine depiction of the individuals here, the way that they look. Portraiture became the substance of much of the artist's business from this point on. Here we have a sketch that Holbein made when he had relocated to England in the late 1520s. He went there on the recommendation of uh, scholar Erasmus and became the court painter. This kind of a sketch doesn't perhaps look too impressive, but a portrait like this certainly is. This is almost photographic in nature. It captures what we think might have been the character of this person in the way that he's carrying on a rather smug and dignified appearance here. But notice the detail, the way the sleeve represents all these folds in a very realistic way, and the, the hands, very detailed with very appropriate shading, and of course the face, almost photographic in quality, we would think. Now the background is very plain. This was at one time the style for portraits, but this changed in about this same era in the 1530s. Here we see another portrait by Holbein a little bit earlier. And notice, in addition to the painting of the individual being depicted, first of all, notice his clothing. Once again, very, very detailed, luxurious and richly done cloth patterns here. But notice all these other things. In the background, we have implements of this person's occupation. I'm not sure what that occupation might have been, but here's letters or cards or something up on a rack. And on this table, here's a scissor, and here's some coins and some sort of a container, and some pointed implement. Here's another tool, another tool. And finally, most impressive, look at this glass container with water in it and some flowers. Very interesting, very tough how to represent glass, which is transparent, with this liquid in it and how it might distort what's behind it to give us the sense of this very delicate glass handle here. What's happening is all these other objects are a test of whether the artist can actually represent these things. They might make the picture more interesting as well. What we're going to see is that this leads directly into the development of genres of art in which eventually the person becomes expendable and the artist simply arranges objects such as those you see here in the form of a still life, selecting objects that appear to be very interesting on some sort of a tapestry like this that might have a fancy pattern to it. And the artist then creates a problem for himself or herself to see if they can adequately represent this assemblage of objects called a still life. We also see artists turning their attentions here a little bit later in the 16th century to this sort of decorative art, this sort of a little piece here uh, representing a love-struck young man and he's sort of pining away for the the woman of his dreams and he might give this to her as a gift and and it's sort of a courting ritual that 
uh, people took with varying degrees of seriousness, but they usually played the game. So people who could afford it might commission pieces like this to be done, uh, showing themselves in appropriately uh, sincere and uh, pensive moods. Here we have Peter Bruegel, a self-portrait of sketch. It appears that he's here, perhaps for his own purposes, mocking uh, a buyer who has money, but perhaps not much in the way of taste, where the artist is in charge of actually creating some scene that might be used to decorate this person's home. The scene that Bruegel would have painted would have probably, at this point, been something like this. Peasant life, where peasants were actually people who were thought to be humorous or sometimes made fun of. Bruegel was not a peasant himself, but he had a great deal of perception in arranging this sort of a scene, the life that might occur in the rural area of a country. In this case, what we think he's done here is sort of tried to make the bride in this case look to be, oh, kind of silly, sort of self-complacent, sitting under this little crown here that designates that she's the bride. And there's a lot of human nature being portrayed here. Gombrich points out this young lad here, hungrily scraping up the scraps of food, this fellow pouring out these jugs, which will be used to serve all of these wedding guests, many more guests waiting in the wings here to enter this hall where they're eating, and the food being distributed this way on a makeshift sort of a carrier that these two people have arranged with these sticks of wood in this plank so that this man is distributing the food. But what we have here is a very artful arrangement where your eye is drawn this way, and along here and right up this man's arm, and look at this, it leads right to the bride, the center of attention at this occasion. We see here two people sort of off having their own conversation, uh, a friar and perhaps some city official. And we also see here a little bit of humor. Here's the musicians hired to entertain at this festive occasion, and it certainly looks like this poor fellow is hungry and is looking here at the food in a very doleful sort of a way, wondering if any of this will be left for him. The musicians might have been paid something in money and given whatever food was left at the end of the uh, event, but it looks like this fellow is kind of hungry at the moment. Here we have an example of what French art turned into in this same period. An artist who was interested in making these sorts of uh, shallow sculptures would have directed his attention perhaps to these types of figures, perhaps creatures of mythology. The styling here, it appears very fine, even though it's shallow, but actually Gombrich compares this to the Cellini piece we saw earlier. This piece, which seems a bit fancy, I think is rather artful in itself, rather a copy of uh, what you might have seen in the earlier Greek era, in that way a little bit of a mimicking of an earlier style, a way perhaps to exercise your talents as a sculptor in a way that would not be offensive to the Protestant church and uh, would be reminiscent of subject matter that would be of interest in a way that appealed to the classic mentality. And here we have another example, Jacques Callot, a person very famed for making many, many etchings, two clowns caricatured here. Callot made many, many etchings of uh, various types of scenes, the horrors of war, for example, etchings that he made on commission from one ruler or another. He developed many techniques associated with etching that were kind of innovative, replacing the wax previously used by etchers with a uh, type of varnish used by loot makers, which was harder and allowed greater amount of detail and durability. Kahlo developed a way to do part of the etching and interrupt the process and block off certain additional portions of the scratched lines and then continue the etching so that the parts that were covered up after just a small amount of etching by acid would develop lesser in the way of lines. He could develop the texture of the etching in this way so that things in the distance be made to appear much lighter, adding to the effect of depth a form of atmospheric perspective applied to just black and white etchings. Very innovative in this particular technique, and Kahlo was a specialist in this. Here we actually see yet another genre of art being explored because the artist is cut off from the type of art that for hundreds and even perhaps over a thousand years occupied artists as the mainstay of their trade, that is church art.